How is it possible, dear viewer? How is it possible that only now, in the year of our Lord, the end of the year of our Lord, 2023, I have only now discovered a book written in my year of Club 27, my year of Club 27, the year of our Lord, 2007, and published in North America in the year of our Lord, 2012, that is, the end of the old world. How is it that I'm only discovering this book, which was written, which was published in 2012, written in the year 2007? How am I only discovering it now, in the, at the end of 2023? How is that even possible? How am I only discovering it now? Which book am I referring to? I've devoured it in like the last six days. Uh, and I feel like I've been given the greatest Christmas gift ever. Um, and I think as time goes on here, and as you see the next videos now that are coming, you will agree that it is really something important. And that is this book. <clears throat> The Flame of Eternity by Christoph Mikalski, an interpretation of Nietzsche's thought. How have I only discovered it now? <laughs> Question for you, dear viewer question for you. What is play? What is childhood play? What is it? What is a little child sitting in a sandbox playing? What is one, what is, if not what is play, what is one of the major characteristics of that play? When a child, when child plays, what is a major characteristic? I would put to you that childhood play is characterized largely, maybe by other things also, but it's largely characterized by absolute indifference to even the possibility of the existence of responsibility. Absolute childhood play is absolute irresponsibility. A little while ago, I was sitting in a library and I was watching the children play in the play area of the library. And I saw a, a normal little boy, intense in play, just absolutely intense. Just a normal boy, seemed happy, seemed good, everything seemed fine. And it was actually rather hilarious, a little bit disturbing, but kind of hilarious because in his, in the intensity of his play, he had it in his mind that he needed to go to a certain area to keep playing appropriately. And in the absolute indifference, the absolute non-awareness of his play, there was another boy also playing who was in the path of where he needed to go. And this boy, he picked up this boy who was in his way and he just, with his eye 
on where he was going, he picked up the little boy and threw him to the ground. Just threw him to the ground. And the boy just kept on going. He didn't even look to see the boy who he threw to the ground if he was okay or what happened. He was truly a child. And he was a normal, healthy child by all appearances. Just a normal child. There's nothing... And it got me thinking, especially after reading this book, when Jesus said, Jesus of Nazareth in the Gospels is reported to have said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for those is the kingdom of heaven. And it got me thinking, what is the kingdom of heaven? What is the kingdom of heaven? And in another place, Jesus said, if anyone causes these little ones to sin, it would be better if he had a noose hung around his neck and uh, attached to a big stone or whatever and thrown into the sea to drown. In, in other words, don't mess with these kids, Jesus is saying. And if you do, you deserve the worst. But what is he saying? He's saying don't disrupt this kingdom of heaven. Or don't cause these little ones to sin. But what is a major characteristic of this kingdom of heaven that these children live in? It is absolute irresponsibility. Absolute unawareness of even the notion of responsibility, even absolute unawareness of cause and effect and how we interact with cause and effect on planet Earth. That is the kingdom of heaven. You see, this boy picked up uh, another boy, threw him to the ground, and that boy who was thrown to the ground started to cry, as you would expect and felt an injustice had been done to him. But from the boy's perspective, who picked him up and, and threw him to the ground, he, 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 he had no malice. He wasn't trying to hurt that boy. The boy just had no concept of cause and effect and how he hadn't developed yet his awareness of how things hurt for other kids, you know, how, uh, you know, children go through that stage where they discover things, and they discover that when they, when they hit another boy, another person, that oh, that hurts you. Okay, I didn't know that. But what did the boy who was understandably, what did the boy who was thrown to the ground do? That little boy cried, and basically felt like an injustice had been done to him. Why did he do that? Why did he do that? But that boy who threw him to the ground, there was no malice in his heart. He was just, he was just hell-bent on playing in a certain direction. He needed to go where he was going to play. That's what he needed to do. Nothing was going to stop him. And he was just, he, there, was, there was no malice. He didn't look back at the boy who he threw through the ground and he didn't think, ah, got him, got him. He didn't think that. He just... He was just going where he was going and nothing was going to stop him because he was hell-bent on play. He was in a state, even in his destructiveness to the other child, I would argue, I would argue, he was and remained in the kingdom of heaven that Jesus talked about. The kingdom of heaven of absolute irresponsibility where responsibility doesn't even exist. The notion of responsibility is not at all a thing. That child, although there was destructive effects to his actions, the end of the child was hurt. That child lived in absolute innocence, still remaining in the kingdom of heaven that Jesus talked about. Absolutely beyond good and evil. There was no good, there was no evil in anything that he did, despite the negative effects. That makes me think of St. Paul, I think it was in Romans, the, his letter to the Christians in Rome, where he talked about how the law brings awareness of sin. Don't do this, don't do that. Brings awareness of sin, and also with it, guilt. That guilt would not exist even if there was no thou shalt not, there would be no guilt. But you see, we don't live in a perfect paradise on this planet. We don't live in a place... Where, every, where 
we are free from consequences, from cause and effect. And so even if you do something totally innocently and it causes harm to others, you might receive harm back yourself. In light of this fact, in light of this fact, dear viewer, what must have happened to these children playing innocently in order to save them from each other, save them from accidents, save them from getting run over by a car? What must happen? The play, tragically, the play of the child has to be interrupted. This interruption of this sacred play sometimes is necessary. Sometimes the mother will very almost violently call out to her child to get off the road because you might, because you might perish. You might get hit by a car. But when, when the, the parent calls that child, it's very disrupting. And sometimes, in many circumstances, the child can feel really criticized in this, for doing something that was just normal. And his kingdom of heaven that the child lives in is disrupted and he's pulled away from it. And tragically, this painful pulling away from the kingdom of heaven of absolute, total irresponsibility is necessary. Indeed, parents have realized long ago that if they don't save the children from this non-awareness of cause and effect and effects of others effects on others the child the child could perish but for a while the parent strives to give the child space where the child can play and as a child the child is unaware of the parameters that have been set up to keep the child safe and just plays intensely to absolutely unaware of the effects of his consequences or his effects of, the, of his actions, unaware of consequences, of cause and effect. The child lives in an absolute state of irresponsibility, the kingdom of heaven. He gets into this, that idea a lot, as do other authors, one particularly that I have in mind. But I feel like I've been given a great gift now. For after getting into this, what is confirmed to me, to this book that was written so long ago, what is confirmed to me is that Nietzsche himself was indeed, as I suspected, all along, a biblical prophet. As I've been reading Zarathustra and narrating it, various aspects of it, I come from some, I come from a background where I know the New Testament extremely well. The Old Testament as well, but not as good as the New Testament. As a kid, I was involved in programs where I actually memorized large sections of the New Testament. And it has truly been a privilege coming from that background, reading Zarathustra, because you realize that Zarathustra is a constant, is in constant dialogue with Christ, with the New Testament. I think there may have been some viewers of this channel who have watched it, who have watched some of the things, that, and they wonder, why is this guy still in religion? Why, why, why is he still in the Bible? He's into Nietzsche. Well, I very ironically, as it turns out, Zarathustra is an end-time prophet, an end-time prophecy that is intended to be a bridge from the Gospels and the New Testament to the new world that is now coming. And now I have this articulated. Now it is clear and I feel like a whole new horizon has been opened up. And this guy of this book has really helped clarify and uh, show, prove that, really. 
Nietzsche was a biblical prophet, an end times, end times biblical prophet. And Zarathustra is meant to be a bridge from the old world of the Bible to the new world, essentially by contradicting, quite ironically, paradoxically, by contradicting and yet bouncing off of the New Testament, Nietzsche proves himself to be a biblical prophet. And so, and what this guy does is he points out that even though uh, Nietzsche see, apparently, apparently seemed to be in absolute defiance and dismissal of St. Paul, not Jesus, but St. Paul, it is quite ironic actually in the end, what this author has done has shown how to now read St. Paul in a way that illuminates Zarathustra. And, quite paradoxically, unites them. And, thus, therefore, for someone like me, and I've always been looking for this for the last 20 20 years, at least last 10, 15 years of my life. I've been looking for this connection. And now there is a unity, a completeness that now I can combine with other authors I have read, which I will illustrate in more depth in much, much longer uh, YouTube videos, which you will need to set aside time for to sit down and, and absorb, which are coming. But I can see now that uh, Zarathustra is indeed, even in its contradiction of the Bible, is the fulfillment of the Bible. Nietzsche is indeed an end times Bible prophet. And everything now comes full circle, becomes whole. And you will see that in the next videos that I'm making. Uh, but in the meantime... I'd encourage you to have a look at this, this one. Uh, written in 2007, published in North America in 2012. The Flame of Eternity. If, if you had all come from the background that I do. If you know the Bible, particularly the New Testament really well, as I do, I still, um, as a kid, I memorized so much of the New Testament. <laughs> I can still quote passages at length. And all the remaining questions that I've had over the years, what is the meaning of resurrection? What is the meaning of, of uh, Jesus died for your sins? What is the meaning of the stone is rolled away? All that now, in combination with other authors as well, but particularly with this guy, makes a lot of sense. And it's very ironic that it was written in the year 2007, because that's when I was, in a, I was in a heavy rock band. And we put out our only album that I've ever, <laughs> our only full-length album that I've ever put out in 2007. We were called By Design. We were abandoned in the middle of the freezing Canadian prairies. Um, and man, was I ever struggling at that time to, understand, to reconcile where I came from and what happened And to answer questions that have uh, tormented me ever since then. And I feel like everything's come full circle. And I'm so... I feel, like I, I feel like now I've been given the greatest gift I've ever received. And this is the greatest Christmas gift. And so everything's coming full circle now. And so anyway, I encourage you to check it out. And uh, it is now, out, and in my mind anyway, I've I spent like six days just devouring this book. Um... Nietzsche, particularly Zarathustra, is an end times biblical prophet that the Bible ultimately points to. But in the same way that the Christians claimed that the Old Testament obliquely pointed to the New Testament. So while you're living in the Old Testament, the Christians claimed um, very obliquely that 
the Old Testament pointed to the New. So also, the New Testament, quite ironically, paradoxically, very obliquely, but still very much so, points to Thus Spoke Zarathustra as its fulfillment. More to come on this. More to come on the grand unity of things in that sense. Although there is no ultimate grand unity. But that, that you know, so I say that kind of ironically. But uh, the fulfillment of things is now confirmed. I can't believe I haven't read this book before. If anyone has ever suggested it to me and I didn't read it, I'm so sorry. I wish I had listened to you. I don't think anyone has though that I'm aware of. Anyway, it is near Christmas now. Merry Christmas to you all. Uh, it is near Christmas at the end of the year of our Lord, 2023. I do hope you have a great Christmas. And uh, next year's going to be a fucking doozy. It's going to be rough. But as this guy points out, Wherever there is tragedy, wherever there is calamity, there is always opening. And as Zarathustra points out, wherever there is an earthquake, also new wells open. New beginnings are possible. And that is coming, I think, next year and in the next many years to come. And like I've said before, do not... Do not look at people like Klaus Schwab and think, how can I resist him? Primarily, don't think that. Think to yourself, what is the subconscious meaning of his Great, great Reset? What is the Freudian subconscious meaning of it? As I've talked about in other videos, which you can check out. Thank you, dear friends. For those who have been with me this far, my, uh, my, my heart, my heart is with you. I really appreciate all of the thoughtful comments over these years that you've followed such a disjointed schizophrenic channel, <laughs> but it does end well, my friends, assuming of course, YouTube doesn't become a total dick and delete this channel, which, which they might, but anyway, see you real soon.